there were other significant Maroon communities that were also thriving in the 1820s and 30s. One of them was none other than Abrahamstown, named after a lazy-eyed African man who was born around 1790 in either Georgia or Pensacola and escaped slavery right around the time of the War of 1812 and was instrumental in every major Maroon war against the U.S. government since the Negro Fort. Welcome to Pilaclaquia, also known as Abrahamstown. side this side of the sign this is supposed to represent where the black seminal or maroon by the name of abraham once lived you go on this side this sign talks about more generally speaking it actually does give recognition to the black seminals unlike a lot of other places around here um, that are associated with with the fight for freedom and independence but um this one says one mile east of here is the site of the town of Pilaclicaha. So that would be like, I think in that direction somewhere. It's established in 1813 by Black Seminoles, meaning many ponds in the Miccosukee language, Pilaclicaha was the largest and most prosperous Black Seminole town in Florida with a population of 100 men. I dispute that to a certain extent because I, there's other maroon towns that had hundreds of more people than that. But it says, uh, women and children. Many black Seminoles were formerly enslaved peoples of African descent who fled bondage to Spanish Florida following the American Revolution. Driven into Alachua and Sewanee regions by Georgia and Tennessee militias, they joined and mingled with the native Seminoles. Black Seminoles, though not formally ad adopted into the Seminole tribe, formed a relationship with the native Seminoles who protected them from slave catchers in exchange for military aid and a portion of their crops as tribute. See, this is one of the things that I also wanted to mention is that the a lot of the Seminoles that I read were actually like, they were hunters. The Red Seminoles were more so hunters. They did engage in, in sedentary farming and things like that. But a lot of the black Seminoles of African descent actually specialized in, in agriculture. So a lot of the crops that they were growing in a town like this, like melon and squash and, 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 and all kinds of other things, and, and also raising livestock, they ended up you know, supplementing what, whatever it was that the natives were actually producing for themselves with hunting. So they kind of had this, like, coexisting symbiotic relationship between the Red Seminoles and the Black Seminoles. And if when the Red Seminoles needed food crops in order to sustain themselves, especially in this precarious time of the, of the whites constantly trying to take their land away, the Black Seminoles were always there with, with farming, with livestock, with food crops, to be able to help exchange and this was this relationship between the two enabled them to really survive and thrive during this time but it also says here it says um at its peak pila Klikaha contained timber thatch and dog homes corn cribs and fences Res residents may have accumulated few possessions beyond simple dishes arms beads and handmade brush brush pottery during the 1820s, the settlement was visited by two American officials, Horatio Dexter and Lieutenant George McCall, who reported herds of cattle and horses along with fields of rice, beans, melons, pumpkins, and peanuts, as I mentioned. So they were growing their own food and su surviving and sustaining themselves in spite of the constant aggression by slave catchers in the U.S. military. On this side, it's more specific to Abraham. All right, so what the sign says here, 
Kilakwekaha was known as Abraham's old town, named after Abraham, the maroon that I was talking about. Who came to the area after escaping slavery in Pensacola around 1826? Now, I have a I'm challenging this year here because 1826, I've never read in any source that he escaped slavery in 1826. Everything I've read shows that he escaped slavery sometime in the very early 1800s. And as, and as a matter of fact, Abraham, according to a lot of records, was actually involved in Negro Fort way back in 1816. Uh, he'd been a runaway, so that means he'd been a runaway since before 1826. He was also involved in the first Seminole War um, in in the towns that were under Billy Bowlegs along the Suwannee River. He was also involved in that as well. And Abraham, in addition to that, was he was one of those guys that helped establish this area here back in 1813. So, well, I don't know if he, actually, I don't know if he's has helped establish this area in 1813, because in 1813, Abraham would have still been farther north along the Suwannee River, helping to fight and defeat Andrew Jackson in the Battle of Suwannee. But at least after 1818, when a lot of the Maroons continued to go farther and farther south into Florida. Because remember, with this area being established in 1813, that coincides with the Patriot War. The Patriot War was mostly in the northeast part of Florida. So a lot of the Maroons that were in and around St. Augustine or Fort Mose, they started to spread farther and farther south. This is where they would have established a village here. Abraham probably would have joined in after the first um, Seminole War, which ended in 1818. Abraham would have come here. He would have been free for a long time. And being here, now I'm realizing, because as we came to this area, I noticed that there was a Dade Massacre historic park. I thought that the Dade Massacre occurred, or actually happened a lot closer to Fort King. But it's actually, we're about 30 miles away from Fort King in Ocala right now. And the Dade Massacre Historic Park is actually probably about five minutes away from here, maybe five to 10 minutes away from here. So this might've been the town that assisted in the Dade Massacre that actually happened where they killed 100 US soldiers. Because the records that I've read in books like this, this is actually supposed to be a depiction of Abraham in Florida's Negro War, Black Seminoles and the Second Seminole War. 1835 to 1842 written by Anthony Dixon this book depicts Abraham as being crucial to this fight um, the Dade Massacre and the Second Seminole War Abraham was they said he was born in Pensacola but as he came up and as he started to get more and more involved with Chief Micanopy with uh, Billy Bowlegs who my brother thinks is funny and it's a funny name you see that he actually started to be get really high in the rankings with the Seminoles and he served as an interpreter see they and actually they call him an interpreter but I actually beg to differ because I think one of the things was this whenever the Seminoles met with the United States government when they went to Washington to meet any black that was negotiating with the Seminoles the Seminoles usually relegated them and I think for strategic purposes to just being interpreters or slaves or servants of these Seminoles when in reality they were equals. They had their own established villages. Abraham's town. You had uh, Cujo's town. You had all these different black maroon villages that were coexisting as almost like a confederacy of separate uh, communities or nations within a nation that were fighting for their freedom. And so they usually, in the, in the secondary sources, you usually find, and not only in secondary sources, but in the primary sources, they usually diminish and belittle the... Uh, the importance of people like Abraham in their fight and in their struggle for, uh, for freedom and independence. But this is the location, this area here would have been where Abraham's town was. But if we continue on, Abraham served as a skilled interpreter, see, and the voice of the Seminoles during the treaty negotiations with the United States government. He rose to prominence as the counselor of Chief Micanopy, even accompanying him on diplomatic trip to Washington, D.C. Abraham was later released from service and appreciation for his work. See, they say he was released from service. They, they as once again, they're minimizing his, his, his role as, as an independent free person. Assuming a connection to the Dade Massacre in 1835, United States Army soldiers under the command of Brigadier General Abraham Eustace burned Pilaklikaha 
to the ground on March 30th, 1836. So this is the village that they assume was actually in. Um, Abraham also was instrumental in, as long as, along with this um, African by the name of John Caesar, they were both instrumental in creating connections between Maroons or Black Seminoles and enslaved Africans on plantations in the newly formed plantations that was popping all over, popping up all over Florida, the sugar plantations and the cotton plantations. So they made these clandestine networks that uh, contributed to the rise of these major slave revolts going on all throughout Central and East Florida. And uh, it also contributed to the, uh, the destruction of the sugar plantations out of the 22 sugar plantations that were established in this very lucrative business in Florida in the 1830s, 21 of them were destroyed. And you can thank um, Abraham, John Caesar, and others who made connections with the enslaved on the plantations for this kind of thing.